All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Grassman Robotics talk series. Uh, we will feature today a panel discussion uh, with uh, uh, three of the uh, finest in the robotics community, which we are very proud to have them here as junior faculty. Uh, Michael Poza, Dinesh Jayaraman, and uh, Pratik Chodari. And uh, the topic uh, we are going to be talking about is uh, embodied AI and robotics. I am Kostas Danilidis, definitely not a junior faculty. And I'm the moderator for this today's panel. Um, if you are joining via Zoom, uh, please submit your questions in the Q&A. And I have the Q&A in front of me. And uh, I will be reading them. And of course, here in the audience, you can ask directly questions. Um, instead of uh, introducing uh, each of you, and uh, uh, I, I'm going to ask uh, the following question for each of you to ask. Uh, later, we are not going to do the full round, but uh, I would like to ask you, what is the most exciting thing you're working on right now? You can mention one thing. And together with that, what do you think uh, is uh, was the uh, result that most excited you like in the last year or so? Not from you. Uh, preferably also not from the Grass Club like which paper or any other result or maybe even uh, industrial invention uh, starting with Pradik. um good morning everyone um uh, so uh i am interested uh, in uh, understanding what properties of the physical world what structure of the physical world allows us to learn and uh, there is obviously structure in the data that uh, we obtain from the world. There is uh, objects in images, uh, there is uh, words in text, uh, there is phonemes um, in, in speech. Uh, and uh, all through the years, uh, uh, I always feel that the, the success of neural networks uh, uh, has come about, uh, not so much because of the peculiar architectures that we build or the, the intricate recipes that we design to train these networks, but really because of this very, very salient and distinctive properties in the data. Uh, the words were put there in text so that uh, we could find them again. The objects were put in the world so that we could use them again. Phonemes were built so that you could identify your mother when she speaks. Uh, and so these tasks were designed by us uh, so that we could do them easily. And I would like to put my finger down on what exactly is the structure of the task. Uh, mm, we spent a lot of time studying uh, tasks uh, in the abstract, I think, in the last uh, five, six years for me personally, but in general for the, for the community. Uh, mm, I've always thought of tasks as probability distributions. Uh, the kind of tasks that uh, you see uh, biological organisms do, like you and I, uh, they do not look like probability distributions. Uh, uh, walking on the road under different lighting conditions is a task. Picking up this bottle of water is a task. I would like to understand how uh, organisms use their different sensory modalities uh, to perform these tasks. Uh, uh, that is that is what I'm most excited about right now. Uh, clearly, there is a very sophisticated combination of different modalities. There is very sophisticated interaction with how we undertake motor control with this information. And that is what I would like to think of robotics personally. Uh, um, I think of robots as a crucible for doing, for understanding biological perception. Um, we would like to put the theories to test, break them, figure out better ways to build robots. So that, that is what I'm most excited about. Uh, should I go for the uh, best? Sure, very shortly. Yeah. So uh, my uh, favorite paper, I think, uh, is uh, uh, this one called Marigold. Um, it's it's an algorithm for monocular depth estimation by some folks in uh, ETH Zurich. Uh, uh, I have uh, uh, watched a little bit from the sidelines the revolution in generative AI. 
uh did not work so much on it myself uh but the last one year convinced me that uh, uh generative ai may be useful for creating content movies and text and images etc but i think uh, it is extremely extremely useful to give us uh, priors for inverse problems uh depth flow all the problems that we thought uh, were uh, that we still think are essential uh, for robotic perception are basically solved uh, because of uh, these generative models and that i find very exciting um i'll try to keep this short uh, let me know if i'm if i'm running too long one time um yeah so uh, hello everyone um so on the question of what we are working on that's exciting um, I kind of started my career as an assistant prof here, kind of working on a few different topics broadly within robot learning. And I think what I've been working on over the last couple of years is trying to articulate what is that concise, like big question that we've been working towards in the various projects in my group. And I think that what I've coalesced towards, and Dan will be really happy to hear this, is uh, the question that we are, <laughs> the question that I think we are trying to address in various ways that we've been asking in various ways is what is the sensory information that a physical learning agent in the world requires in order to learn and perform tasks. Mm. And how does that question, how does the answer to that question vary as a result of, as a function of the task, as a function of the agent characteristics, as a function of the phase of learning that the agent is in? Uh, and I think once that, uh, that kind of framing of the question uh, really hit me, uh, we've now been kind of tackling that question a little bit more head on. And one recent result from my group that I'm really excited about is um, that we've found that it is, in fact, uh, more important at early stages of learning for a novice learner to be provided with additional sensory modalities, uh, because that is the time at which you need more information about the environment. And this is actually a very intuitive thing, if you think about it, uh, because when do you need information about the world? You need information about the world when it surprises you in various ways, maybe because the dynamics of the world are not what you expected, or maybe they're stochastic, or maybe because you don't know exactly how to invert the observations into a state, and so you have a kind of vague distribution over the state. And all of that tends to happen much more when you are new into an environment or to a task or to a body. And it turns out indeed that we can actually show empirically in a reinforcement learning setup that uh, you benefit a lot from having access to additional sensors primarily at the time uh, when you're learning, uh, and and uh, that the benefits of uh, having those additional sensors afterwards, after you've completely learned the policy, are significantly smaller compared to having access to those sensors at uh, at training time. So that's something that I'm quite excited about, and we're kind of continuing to build on it in a few different ways. Um, so I'll I'll then come to the second question, for which I was just discussing with Michael that I I was racking my brains for one result that I was really excited by, and I kind of hit on a somewhat safe answer, which is that I'm excited about the fact that we are, I think, um, now getting around to the point where we can evaluate kind of a longstanding claim in, in robot learning, which is that uh, supervised learning is never going to solve robotics. Um, and I think uh, a lot of companies and a lot of universities have thrown a lot of power behind gathering really large data sets and really putting that claim to the test. Uh, I think that it will work out to be true, but I think what will also emerge as a result of all the work that follows from you know, Droid and Aloha and, uh, and, uh, and uh, OpenX embodiment and all of these big data sets is that we will get a much clearer picture of what really are the problems left to solve in robotics. And hopefully there will be much fewer uh, silly robot learning papers on tasks that the community already knows are very simple to solve. And we will no longer expend our collective efforts on trying to demonstrate um, kind of pick and place tasks. Okay. Um... Yeah, glad to be here. So to, to the sort of the first question, uh, what's what's most exciting in the lab? Um, we, we've been really sort of focused on how to do real-time decision-making in complex multi-contact settings. And, and to do so uh, when a robot maybe hasn't seen this particular environment before. So a robot's going to enter your home or your workplace and have to accomplish a task very quickly. And, and so the sort of the core questions surrounding this or how do you you know gather the information you need in a timely manner how do you make use of it quickly and then once you have the information can you actually you know do something with it quickly at, at human-like speeds and in many ways you know 
I've been sort of dancing around this question since the start of my PhD, where nothing was real time and everything was very slow and planned offline. And I think in the last couple of years, we've really gotten to see those different pieces put together, um, coming from the the data efficient learning side, where I think it'd be very natural to think, oh, I have fast, stiff contact dynamics, therefore my optimization or learning is stiff, therefore it's going to scale badly. And it turns out we can sort of break that paradigm and and in many ways have our cake and eat it too and learn things very quickly and, and efficiently and accurately all at the same time. And then we can put those into a control framework and we actually can execute real-time control that decides what to touch and where to touch it at at very, very fast rates and, and kind of uh, um, unintuitive settings. So I think we're sort of really starting to see the point where we can like lay out a pretty hard task and, and actually accomplish it um, uh, in, at, at very, you know, human-like speeds. Um, to the, yeah, okay, that's the next time we're talking about this. I think, I think it's tricky to put the, the finger on exactly what the most ex, single, most exciting thing is from the last year. I think there's a lot, a lot that's happened. I, I, maybe I'll, I'll sort of point to two slightly different things. And one, I think will come up later when we talk about companies, but I think seeing the power right now of imitation learning has been, been quite shocking. And so the, the, say the diffusion policy paper that came out last year, where, if you look at these companies that are raising, you know, billion dollar valuations right now off of imitation learned policies that it's not clear that they're going to accomplish anything, you know, maybe we'll come to this later, but, but they look impressive. So it's like, if you want to get a robot to do something that looks really exciting quickly, you actually can right now, right. And, and do so fairly quickly. Um, and then I think the other thing I might point to for a long time, there's been this doubt that uh, the sort of classical control approach of do estimation and connected to your controller was not going to work because the estimation was really hard and the, the visual tracking didn't work all that well. And, and so maybe you should be better off kind of just skipping that and, and going end to end. And, and I'm not going to say that's a wrong approach, but I, I we're seeing sort of signs of life in the last year that vision segmentation and tracking at real time and complex scenes actually might work to the point where you could connect that to something downstream. So I, so I'm starting to wonder whether sort of that, that decomposition actually has, has a sign of life for, for the future. Um, so that's exciting to me. Things like segment anything, for example, or uh, various object tracking technology. I had even forgotten the segment anything happened in the last year. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, so I will pick up uh, on the word imitation and uh, to go into uh, embodiment. So during the last uh, few years, we have seen a lot of uh, triumphs in uh, non-embodied things like uh, video generation, text generation. Uh, regarding embodied things, uh, we see rather the opposite. The most successful company in the world, iRobot, has fired like 400 people. Uh, Cruise is... Uh, uh, shutting down operations. Uh, I haven't heard any, except maybe the data set that uh, Dinesh is participating uh, that was announced yesterday. I haven't heard any other exciting result in embodied things. And uh, I would like to pose the following uh, like uh, question in terms of the actual embodiment. Uh, when uh, we are seeing uh, this uh, like thousands of videos, for example, of robots in a kitchen, okay? Uh, the people have uh, first uh, two hands. 70% of these videos have uh, two arms, okay? Though 90% of the demos we see are usually with one arm or trying to accomplish things just with one arm. Uh, also, the humans use actual uh, five-finger hands, right? And on the other hand, I see like companies still selling like the uh, pneumatic robots. So the humans uh, use uh, actually four sensors. They use uh, like their IMUs. Uh, they use uh, additional sensors like uh, audio, for example. Uh, animals use uh, IMUs. And uh, so both at the sensing level, and uh, at the actuator level, and I will not go into arm, into legs and uh, actually locomotion, purely even in the case of hands. Uh, we are seeing pretty much disabled robots in terms of sensing 
and actuation try to accomplish intelligent things. Okay? So, and uh, if one opens Wikipedia for evolution, obviously the answer is there in what I'm saying. Because evolution has built these things, the sensors and the hands for like millions of years. And in a few thousand years lately, uh, has built like uh, language and this kind of things. So how can we really take advantage instead of talking like, and this is also not against learning or it's against in general, the abstract formulations, y is equal cx, x dot is equal ax, uh, p of y given x. How can we put the actual physics, forces and torques and the actual sensing into these models instead of having just pixels? which uh, admittedly, we have a big of success of. So how is the embodiment reflected in, should be reflected in the robotics research? Yeah. Sure. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot, of, lot to unpack there, Costas. I think the, the hardware design is obviously critical and, and I think you know, we would be foolish to claim that the, the sort of hardware that, that people are running on right now is is anywhere close to where it needs to be to to get to, uh, you know, human-like behaviors. And that comes from sensing, that comes from dexterity in the hands, that comes from, you know, speed and force capabilities. I, I think all, all of the above, you know, needs to be improved. Um, yeah, I think there's an interesting question of sort of how far you can get with, locking yourself into some particular embodiment versus trying to co-evolve the embodiment and the learner or such control policy. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see. I think lots, you know, lots of people have sort of skewed towards the, the very computer science perspective of just algorithms and the robot is just a thing that, that comes along for the ride. Um, I, I, I think you'll, we'll see, progress there i think there's no doubt about that but i think it's ultimately going to be limited um and then to the other side of you know how i think lots of people are you know our lab you know included are, are thinking very carefully about how to include forces and physics and and you know elements within the the architecture so i think i think there is maybe i should let the anyone who wants to argue for more purely pixels perspective counter that but i think that that is still very alive in the community it's not maybe certain subsets. But not in the development of new hands, for example, or, I mean, this is really, we are still at the uh, uh, Neolithic period, probably. H hands are really hard, right? I mean, I think, you know, I've, I've spent some time talking to people out there who are are uh, developing arms right now, because I think sure, the robot arms out there are are insufficient because they, they're not fast enough and they, they have lack force transparency. Um, and my question to them has been, well, why are you working on an arm? The arms actually aren't that bad. You should be working on a hand. And, and the answer has, from everyone has been, well, the hand's too hard. So we're going to try to get the arm right first and then we'll try a arm later. I mean, I, this, the, the scale factor is really tricky. Well, I'm not sure if I'm fully addressing your question, but I have a couple of kind of thoughts that are roughly connected. Um, so I think um, the community is broadly arriving at kind of similar conclusions to what you're saying. And this is also what I was hinting at when I said, um, I'm hoping that part of the realization, part of the fallout from all of this kind of large data scaling efforts that uh, we are seeing now is that we will step away from the kinds of tasks that are clearly uh, not very informative to demonstrate our algorithms on and start doing more complex things. I think some of that is ha beginning to happen. People are beginning to gather uh, bimanual data. Uh, we've seen actually just in the last year, a couple of exciting ways of doing this uh, with kind of puppet robots. Um, and, uh, and I think that the kinds of tasks that they are demonstrating are already really informative. Uh, I think that that's kind of uh, on the same, it's in the same bag for me as kind of uh, uh, hands uh, in that it's kind of a cheap way of arriving at hands. It's kind of a distributed hand once you have multiple points of contact because you have two two-finger drippers. You're kind of beginning to be able to do some of the things that you would normally think of as dexterous, right? Um, and uh, I think it's it's kind of clever and it's exciting to see that beginning to happen. Another thing that I wanted to um, say was that 
I think that that question of, you know, how does morphology affect the answer to these questions is really interesting. Um, also from the perspective of the question that I laid out as being something that I, uh, we've been thinking about in my group for some time, um, which is this question of what is the information that we need? And an example that I often like to bring up is if you have a compliant hand, then all of a sudden the demands on what you need to actually perceive in the environment begin to be very dramatically different from if you have a kind of rigid, uh, you know, um, uh, kind of uh, hand as well as the low level controller that's operating on the hand, right? Once you have a compliant hand, you can begin to say that actually, I just kind of broadly need to know what the geometry of the object is and roughly where it is. And I can kind of pick it up without really needing to precisely uh, identify its geometry and precisely identify its location and pose. Instead, I can kind of do a much rougher job of it. And so the interaction between what you need to do in, in uh, perception and in control and what you need to put in the hardware is really interesting. I mean, this is embodied intelligence, right? This is kind of what people have been thinking about for a long time, but I think that they're beginning to be relevant also to uh, the kinds of questions we are asking in robot learning. Uh, I had the next question for you, Pratik. So, uh, but we can come back to the uh, actual embodiment. Um, there is the expression uh, called bitter lesson, uh, which uh, says uh, that uh, at the end, uh, however clever your algorithm or your architecture will be, uh, putting uh, in the system more data and uh, more uh, compute will probably provide a better solution than uh, what uh, you would have uh, with uh, even just a better architecture or uh, alg uh, algorithm. So one example of this is, for example, that uh, we, uh, I mean, by just predicting the next word uh, with uh, quite a simple uh, architecture uh, and using uh, uh, as many uh, uh, actually uh, parameters uh, as the number of uh, words uh, seen uh, in the training data set, uh, we can uh, pass exams, right? So, uh, scaling the data in robotics problems and uh, just applying uh, simpler things like uh, uh, predicting the next video frame or rolling out, for example, and having a, a, a video generation as a guiding, uh, as a desired trajectory in the control system. Uh, would it solve our problems or uh, why not? Let, let, let me answer it. Uh, so I think there are two, two parts here. One is uh, is scaling sufficient, mm -hmm. and um, is this kind of scaling good enough? Uh, yeah, and uh, I am I'm, uh, really, I mean, Dines mentioned that uh, about the annotation. We are talking now about completely self supervised things, right? So I think uh, even if you were to live in the world of uh, supervised learning, I would say that one must have two ways of looking at it. One is uh, certainly there is no denying that uh, with enough data and lots and large enough compute, you will be able to get behaviors that are interesting, useful. And, uh, and, and new. Uh, but the question is, uh, what does it teach us? Does it, does it let us build systems that are efficient? Uh, uh, unlikely. It will let us build systems that work well in different environments. That is likely. But at the end of the day, mm, you, you will be suffering from uh, efficiency, either in terms of information that you get from data or in terms of uh, how much compute you need to run uh, so there is still, uh, I, I think the, the scientific question there is how can you uh, make things efficient while we're starting from large amounts of data? Uh, I think there is also a more intellectual question where uh, why do we care to do all this? Well, some of us are interested in building robots, uh, let's walk around. Some others may be interested in understanding why uh, animals can walk around. Suddenly, for the second question, it is not sufficient to just predict behavior. We have to build theories. We have to crystallize this knowledge into some some actual uh, uh, stuff that we pass on to the next batch of robotics. So there is still value in. Uh, uh, but in natural language, there was no theory built uh, to pass on to the next. Uh, we are very successful by running. Uh, uh, large language models. Yes, and, and so if, if our job, uh, so I, I, I actually project this particular complaint on the same two axes. Uh, suppose your job was to predict uh, uh, the next word or build a system like ChatGPT, great, we have achieved it. Uh, 
uh, we are suffering right now from the fact that it's too expensive to run. So surely the knowledge of language will help us to make it more efficient. And certainly the fact that we've built this system has taught us nothing about language, and that is a pretty big inadequacy in how we went about went about solving this problem. Uh, so I, I, I think uh, it, it is not uh, uh, data certainly helps, but the, the question that we are after should be clear in our heads as to why we are doing this. The the second question that you asked was about self-supervised learning. I mm, I would love it if predictive coding or predictive uh, 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 prediction of future is the foundation principle for all kinds of behaviors. Uh, I think the jury is still out uh, as to whether it is good enough. Uh, I, oops, my best answer did not go to the internet. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I, I think uh, uh, certainly it is a foundational principle. Uh, if you look all across uh, biology, all the way from the molecular scale inside the nucleus to all the way to society, uh, you do uh, you you take actions by imagining what these actions will do in the future or how your observations will look in the future. So it would be nice if this was the one principle that allows us to build everything. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I want to echo what Pratik said about, uh, you know, we, we have to kind of ask the question, why are we trying to, why are we interested in building these these models? And uh, so maybe like two things, right? One, um, yes, kind of in the limit of infinite compute and infinite data, of course, the right thing to do is to um, kind of take the simplest systems with the least biases, the least kind of preconceived notions of how language works or how control works and just kind of, you know, let the, let the uh, uh, gradients program your system entirely, right? Uh, but that is uh, somewhat, uh, it's both a doomy and gloomy statement to make. And also it's perhaps not even interesting in, um, in every setting. Uh, you kind of have to ask the question, how long will it take you to get to infinite compute and infinite data? What does it mean to get you there? Uh, will we even get to infinite compute in ways that actually manifest this vision, uh, given that you know computation is not forever going to be increasing? or it's not going to be increasing at least at the same rates that it has been increasing so far. Uh, and the second point that uh, that uh, Pratik made is also a really important one, which is um, that we, we should, I mean, a lot of what is exciting to me about working in the space and what drew me to work in the space as a PhD student is that uh, I'm interested in understanding how we are able to do so little, so much with so little, right? Uh, and uh, you know, if if my only goal is to kind of build that engineering artifact of a system that works, uh, I might even concede to you that maybe there is it's worth putting uh, placing some bets on uh, simply scaling what we already know about how systems might work well uh, with as much data and as much compute as you can throw at them. But uh, there are lots of interesting questions to be asked outside of that one goal. So I resonate with your answer. Uh... But your answer is epistemological, that you don't like the way, not that it will not work, okay? Yes, that's right. We don't know yet whether it will not end, but which I really agree, that uh, it's more uh, we shouldn't do that, not... Uh... <laughs> and uh, Dan Podicek. Uh, but that doesn't mean that these things work. And so they're uh, very scary when you start putting them into the wild world with the genetic industry. So far, they haven't been too much genetic industry. Mm -hmm. But I see there's a company in California that's growing large language models that are, so it's going to be great. Do these things work? So uh, uh, allow, allow me to answer this uh, from the perspective of from an out, uh, not from my perspective. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, just just, uh, just as a uh, thought experiment. So uh, these things uh, do work. They do things that are very surprising. It is ridiculous to me how the completions are so meaningful. So clearly they're working at some level. We may not be happy. Doesn't matter how they work. It is clear, it is clear that they do work, right? We may disagree about uh, uh, how well they work and how they were built, etc. But the fact is that we are looking at new behaviors, uh, and 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 they are rather surprising uh, to everyone. Uh, now, uh, 
I agree with you that uh, they do not work by the standards uh, of certain disciplines or certain applications. The the coffee machine always works when I switch it on. The chat GPT doesn't work always when I want it to work. So there is there is a far ways to go in in building good systems out of this. But I I think uh, we are at the beginning and we are at a very interesting beginning. Yeah, I I, I have similar thoughts. I mean, I think the extent to which these things work in ways that surprise basically everybody, uh, you know, um, I think it's it's undeniable to some extent that they do work. Um, and uh, they're obviously not at the levels where you would put them in any critical application. They're not engineered systems yet, but they show the promise of potentially becoming something that you could rely on at some point in the future. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can trust this. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I don't want to be a troublemaker, but I am a troublemaker. <laughs> Forgive me. Uh, what I would like to hear, what is your dream 20 years from now? What do you want to be remembered 20 years from now? I came here in 72 and started to build up that things but then at the end of 70s 80s i con i observed from psychology the act that perception is not passive is active and hence i wrote this paper on active perception and then i built by little by little the pieces that kind of fit into that whole paradigm so I am challenging you guys. What is your big dream? What do you want? For example, Mike, you are into control. Well, uh, many people are in your space and very smart people are in your space. So um, where do you think you can make a dent of unique Mike Paulson? I give you an example. I have been thinking about evolution in robotics. When a young, when a horse born, it can walk immediately. In human, as you know, your children takes about 12 months or so before they can really walk. What is it? Well, you can say DNA, but there must be some other things. So <clears throat> anyway, in terms of theory, what I would like to hear is recognition, and this is not new, that some of the processes can be done much faster if you do them in analog. So there was this discrete event system proposed by some logicians, but you should think about it where you can shrink the computation making it analog and then switching when you need switching. Uh, do not follow the crowd, please. You know, if M MIT sneezes, you don't have to cough. <laughs> okay. Be original. Think about out of the box. And of course, scaling and Anyway, I have a lot of things to say, but thank you. Thank you very much, Rujina. You preempted uh, my more my last uh, question, but uh, let's uh, we can take other comments from the audience uh, right now on what we discussed and until now on embodiment and uh, uh, scaling. Uh, Mark Yim, for example, says that uh, in the kitchen with disabled robots doing intelligent things. It's actually robots doing human-like things, which may or may not be intelligent. Should we be doing only, should we be doing only human-like things for embodied AI? And that's probably sort of more the bias of the people who are on the stage than than anything else. I mean, I think there's a lot of value to doing human-like things. I mean, one of the one of the the many promises of our field has been that we are going to ultimately 
release machines into your home or your workplace that are going to help you. And, 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 and often that does mean performing human-like tasks, but, but that's certainly not the, all, the whole of robotics, right? There, there's many other you know, brilliant people, Mark included, who are working on problems that look more like you know, releasing robots into settings that humans don't go, can't go, and to do non-human-like things. So, so I'd say that's more of our, our bias than anything else. Just to uh, riff off it, uh, we are very happy to build robots that look like assembly lines. Uh, they are economically, obviously, the right thing to do. Uh, so it is not as if we always want to build robots that look like humans or do what humans mm -hmm. do. Um, so I, I have, uh, uh, before I go into a question also about uh, robotics and uh, society, uh, I would like to continue uh, the question for Ruzina about what to do and uh, what would you tell uh, a starting robotics uh, PhD student uh, about uh, the challenges 20 years from now, not uh, just uh, this year? and uh, uh, how to cope with uh, the inequity in computational resources. I think I got the answer because you like uh, little things. <laughs> and uh, also um, uh, how to deal, for example, with uh, how we can, what can we do? Uh, and I know there is now a US roadmap for robotics and so on, but uh, how can we do really to boost uh, the robotics uh, industry uh, more towards uh, uh, a direction where we think it will be uh, successful? Maybe I, I'll start with the first part of your question. I, I think, you know, and this is building on something that Rujna said, the, the thing I would, and I do say this now, I've started, I've started ending all of my talks with this, um, is, is find something to work on where you have something unique to say, where you have some unique impact and some unique insight. Um, I, I think it's 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 very distressing to see a lot of people right now racing towards an idea where they know another 50 people are working on the same idea. And the only question really is who's going to get there first. I, I think find a problem that if you don't work on it, it's not going to get solved. Right, and and that's the way you're going to have an impact on society, and on the field, and on research. Um, and I think the other thing to add to that is, you know, thinking of this industry academic divide and, and the the massive gap in resources. We don't have the compute and the scale and the professional engineers. What we do have is the ability to take risks and to be wrong and to to be ambitious. And, and we have young people for for with all the the great things that comes with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I mean that, right? I think, I think there's challenges, right? You know, but, but, but yeah, I mean, be wrong, right? I mean, think about what if the prevailing wisdom right now is wrong? So what are the next questions going to be? And we can answer that and we can take those risks. Yeah. Um, I, I, um, I have, uh, similar things to echo, um, uh, and similar things also to what Rujina said. I think, uh, particularly now, we have a kind of a, a climate around these kinds of topics around AI, robotics, where uh, there's kind of this like groupy culture on uh, on the internet, where there's a bunch of very ill-informed people who are essentially kind of ML celebrity stalkers who will just kind of like uh, amplify anything that their favorite ML celebrity happens to say. And uh, it is very difficult, I think, in this climate for students to uh, not seek validation from these crowds that are you know, somehow just kind of, you know, set on pushing one agenda. Uh, you should recognize that there are very powerful commercial interests behind these these agendas and that, uh, you know, they might not have the right answer. And even if they do have the right answer, you gain very little from being one cog in that machine and being kind of doing essentially replaceable work. Uh, listening, like letting these people curate what you read and uh, thinking of their tweet threads as essentially your uh, literature surveys uh, is not the way to be great as a researcher. Uh, you need to you need to find your own papers. You need to read things that other people are not reading, and uh, to find your own questions. Uh, it's it's not easy to do. Um, I would say that I get excited about a new question every other year. So it's not that I know what is going to be important in twenty years, but at least I know that there are questions that I'm thinking about that other people aren't thinking about, and that brings me a certain joy. 
uh, I think I have a slightly different perspective on what new students should do. I think uh, so we are here to to learn in a university for the duration of our PhD. And it is, uh, uh, we should work on exactly what excites us. If 500 other people are working on the same problem, fine. Uh, race with them, race, and doesn't matter if you win or lose. But the point is to work on stuff that you're excited about. I think that the, the place where uh, the, 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 the biggest point that I always emphasize in the group is to be honest about what you're doing. Uh, just because 500 people are working on something, you don't have to do things the way they are doing it. You may be interested in the exact same problem. Uh, there may be commercial interest, doesn't really matter, but be honest to the problem. Uh, understand what it means for something to work. Uh, and uh, more often than not, it will require you to dig into the depths. You cannot do superficial things and make progress. I think this is, this is really the truth. Uh, doesn't matter how many people are churning their wheels, doesn't matter how loudly they are screaming on the internet. Uh, so long as people are honest uh, about their progress, they will always learn. Um, so I, I really don't, uh, I, uh, I, ha I happen to work with a certain style or a certain taste, uh, uh, but I, the, the fact that I don't work on a certain problem, I take it as just a, uh, just a banal fact and nothing strategic or nothing uh, uh, that I that I choose a priori. Um, just as a follow up to this, uh, uh, very wisely uh, said, uh, the uh, PhD these days uh, uh, became also uh, a credit in your CV to get an amazingly high salary. Uh, and also, on the other hand, uh, bigger companies do not cannot work without PhDs. I mean, there is no way for bigger companies to educate their people. This is uh, somehow unique in, in in the history of science that uh, PhDs have uh, so much value. Uh, and uh, how do you think uh, do you think uh, this should affect the way we educate? our uh, PhD students uh, or not? Also, in the, uh, given also the motivation that uh, uh, some uh, uh, before it was only the, uh, like the obsession with having the, a high experience, uh, the only thing to do a PhD. Right now it can be just, oh, I want a $300,000 salary after graduating, right? Which I cannot probably find not even from any degree, not even from Wharton, right? I can do it though by doing AI, all right? So how do we deal with that as educators? Is there a question? <laughs> yeah. So what is the question again? The question, the question is that PhD, PhD never had such a high value. Yeah both monetary for the PhD holder themselves, as well as for the company who cannot really work, the companies cannot really work without PhDs. Microsoft could develop Windows without PhDs. Right now, they cannot develop GPT without PhDs. Yes. At my retirement age, I read a lot of history. If you look at the famous scientists, they never went for money. Science is not, it has to be your passion. You are curious, you want to discover. And if you are lucky, you know, sometimes a small piece is taken up and, and uh, somebody else makes money. I mean, you go to Wharton School and those folks will help you to make money. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, if, if I look through, John McCarthy was my advisor. As you know, he invented the word AI. Why he was genuinely interested in how do we represent knowledge of the world about us in interaction. And it's really still a puzzle because if you look at the measurements we make, color, white white 
The word white means many things depending on the illumination, depending on everything else, as Costas will know. And many other labels have so many different interpretations. You know, what does it mean up next to uh, spatial relationships? So, but you don't get much money if you, so he invented before, because he was so interested in these semantic representations, he invented the programming language Lisp. And I talked to him, he was a, he was a student at Princeton and he told me, Ruzhna, I really wanted to do topology, but I was not good enough. Okay, so he went to logic. And so we, we all have limitations, but if you have curiosity, that should drive you what you really want to do, and then you will succeed. Uh, you, huh? you, you can keep, you can keep the microphone. Micro. You can keep the microphone. Okay. <clears throat> uh, you can move on if you want. Okay, I want, uh, I want to say, I mean, I don't think that there is anything dirty about wanting to make money, right? I think it's okay. Uh, I, did, because, I didn't say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think I think uh, it's uh, it's okay for students, for PhD students, to have that as an objective in their minds, um, uh, as kind of one long-term career goal. Money means different things to different people. They might have their own circumstances. And, and you know, as three people who did not make that choice, uh, you know, it's kind of uh, we obviously have our biases. But I do not uh, think of it as um, somehow flippant or less serious for PhD students to want to eventually join an industry and make money. Um, I think I would ideally like that that money is made in a way that uh, actually adds value to society. It reflects that you are creating something new in the world that is impacting the world in, in important ways. And perhaps that's the reason that you're accumulating money. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure if that's, the climate in which things are currently working. Right now, it feels like a little bit of a Ponzi scheme where everyone is trying to uh, convince everyone else that to make everything work, uh, which uh, is somewhat distasteful. But other than that, I don't really see a problem. If you're going to like try to start a company and you're really convinced that you're going to add value in the world and make uh, you know make a lot of money that way, you know more power to you. Sure. On the other on the other side, uh, should we change anything in our education, given that? Uh... Uh, we we are really the universities are uh, indispensable right now for the development of artificial intelligence and robotics. Uh, if uh, somehow a dictator would come in and abandon PhDs, the economy would collapse, right? So, is there any way to prepare our PhDs uh, in any particular way better for working in uh, industry? I don't know if we have to change anything necessarily. I mean, I think the goal sort of in many ways remains the same is to to develop people who are going to be, you know, thought leaders in, in their field who are going to be able to ask interesting and insightful questions and then, you know, create scientific routes to, to answering those. Um, it, it is weird right now. I mean, I, I certainly know when I went for my PhD, the, the thought was, okay, I'm going to leave industry. I'm going to go for a PhD. I'm going to stop making money. Uh, and then when I leave, I might make the same amount of money as I was making when I start when I started, right? When I left my my job as a you know as an engineer, and and that's not the case anymore. Right? I mean, it, it is in academia, but but it's not the case anymore in industry. And it is it is yeah. I mean, I, I don't have an answer of what we should do to respond to that, if anything. But uh, I think we want to deliver to the world, you know, fantastic, brilliant people who are capable of, of driving their own projects. Uh, uh... I think we should change how we educate, uh, and and the the reason I say this is because uh, uh, let's say thirty years ago, forty years ago, we were happy to pick niche problems uh, and dig super deep in them. I have friends uh, who studied uh, algebra for seven eight years to do their PhD. Great stuff, uh, uh, and we are still we should still do these kinds of things. Uh, but it is pretty silly if at the end of your PhD you cannot find a job. It's pretty embarrassing, I think. Uh, so uh, we need skills, uh, and it is embarrassing not just for 
the person. It's us embarrassing for us as educators if we cannot train students who are useful to the society uh, in in this way. Uh, so, it I I think uh, the 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 trends in which education is changing uh, forces us uh, to develop uh, a two pronged approach to a PhD. One which is digging deep into these problems. And the second one, which is collecting the essential skills that you need to be successful at a job in the industry. Um, and uh, we shouldn't sacrifice one for the other. There is a reason why people go in the summers to internships, uh, because they learn, they get exposure to new problems. And over the course of my career, I have always uh, uh, flirted um, across these two axes. Uh, I have found it extremely useful to do so because I get exposure to new problems when I think uh, like a punk and uh, uh, I get uh, new ways of solving those problems when I think like a big fancy scientist. And there is there is merit to both of these things. Uh, and I think uh, we would be pretty bad educators if we did not appreciate how the world is changing. Great. May I have one last please? Yes. That... The faculty should think about some big problems to solve collectively. You know, centers make at Berkeley the the the, the, the big um, success was that Shankar Shastri was a genius how to put together different groups of people to for centers. And Arvind Joshi and I had a center, first center, NNSF, and from there on we went to the Army Center, etc. The advantage of having a center is not that it also gives you support for multiple students or from multiple different skills, but it also creates a visibility that attracts industry. IBM is not going to come here to support one person or with one student or two students. But if you create a center which gives multiple skills, then companies will come. Thank you, Rosina. Uh, questions from you, from everybody? Yes, uh, can you uh, probably pass the mic on? Yeah, so I have a question about uh, who are we solving the problems for kind of question, right? So um, I've explored some of the industries like, you know, fruit industries, agriculture, uh, fishing and stuff like that. So in these industries, uh, people haven't really benefited from a lot of the robotic stuff or at least how we are trying to think of robotics right now. So all these, you know, like venture capitalist money that's going into robotics research and stuff, we think about like home automation. We think about, hey, how do I make a robot serve me a cup of tea, you know, before I go back, right? But then if you look at how people pick apples right now, like all the apples that you pick, uh, that you eat are hand-picked, right? And the fish processing is also by hand, it's manual. And the manufacturing of a wind turbine blade, that's also manual, right? But the thing is, we don't expect, so we don't really explicitly think about these tasks, but these are at the same time the most strenuous tasks, right? So do you think there's a divide or do, do you think there's a problem of robotics not serving the right population or not improving the, the problem of inequality that the society faces? I think there's a couple of things there. One is there are people who do work in agricultural robotics, so it's not a completely devoid field. Um, but I, I I think there's also just economic questions that I'm maybe not well served to answer, but a lot of the jobs you're talking about are very low wage jobs um, and replacing them with robots that don't work very well is, is probably not that that cost effective. Um, so I, I think definitely, I mean, there's companies out there doing this as well, thinking about picking right um, uh, in, in, in many different settings and research papers that go along with that as well. So I think pe people certainly are are pushing these directions forward. They're a little bit harder to get to work in academic settings because of the requirements for actual trees and dirt and you know the sort of practical bits of the field robotics. But um, I, I don't, you know, the, the fact the fact is, uh, you know, this money is flowing towards these general purpose robots. And maybe that's another question whether any of us think that's possible to succeed in this day and age. But 
we it's not like we have a home robot yet. So you're saying, okay, why are we working on home robots? Well, because it sort of it drives a lot of the core fundamental questions that you would apply in other settings. Um, but it's not quite like money has flowed into home robots and except for the last six months or so. Yeah. Uh, I think it's kind of natural for uh, when a technology is nascent for people to explore the kind of consumer facing aspects of the technology first. Uh, you can take some lessons from kind of um, how cameras developed, right? Like cameras uh, as a technology were quite obscure until maybe like the late 80s or 90s when all of a sudden they were in every home. And uh, that eventually benefited basically everybody, right? So, um, you know, you could have surveillance in, a, in, in the army, but you could also have, um, you know, field monitoring uh, and you could have these miniature cameras on drones and you could have be, be them deployed basically everywhere, right? Uh, so I think it is natural for capital to flow towards where the where there is most money to be made, but the benefits of it will hopefully then eventually trickle to other to other applications. Any other question from the audience? Uh, I would like to thank uh, our panelists. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, next uh, Friday, we will have uh, uh, Zach uh, Manchester from uh, uh, CMU, uh, same time uh, for our grasp on robotics. For more information, uh, be sure to follow us on social media and check out our website. Have a great weekend.